Hey, Rogue Heads and Rogueettes, this is the Rogue Head Huddle presented by RGR Football. This is your boy Gooch. That is the home and keys. And we're finally back and we're excited to talk to you about football. Gooch, pay the bills. First of all, let me just say, man, it's good to be back. It's been about a month. We took a little vacation on y'all, but we're back. Vacation's over. Um, make sure you check out the RGR store. Subscribe to the channel. Go back. Look at some of the other videos. Check out the live stream Monday and Thursday. Um, yeah, support your boy RGR. Take this walk with us. All right. So it's gonna be a good one today, our, folks. It's gonna be a good one. Yeah, if I can get my light to stay on, that'll help. So I want to start with opinions. And really, this is just a reminder for all of us, myself included, that we all have different opinions and it's okay for us to disagree and it's okay for us to disagree without wanting to rip other people's heads off. Um, it's a little bit harder to do right now with everything going on with the team and people have very strong opinions about everything, basically. And so... We all need this reminder. I I need this reminder. And so we all have opinions. Gooch and I don't always agree on things. Sometimes we exactly agree, and sometimes we couldn't disagree more, and we get a little heated. But at the end of the day, I mean, we're still humans, and we, we still enjoy each other. So if somebody's opinion gets you that mad, take a step back and don't let – an opinion stop you from treating another person like a human. So uh, it's just kind of a public service announcement and probably very appropriate for what we got ahead of us here because right now we're just going to talk about this Chiefs team as of today, October 13th, 2001. We're setting it 2-3. and three. In some sense, we could just as easily be 0-5 and, and with some things being different, we could possibly be 5-0. and oh. I'm actually kind of, in some way, I'm happy about this. Because, oh, this first off, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with my personality. I consider myself a realistic optimist, which means I'm not completely blind to everything. Everything is perfect. Everything is rosy. Everything's going to be great. And I'm not a complete pessimist either. And so, uh, you know, the sky is falling. And I think Gooch is fairly the same, maybe even more so than I am or, or better at it than I am. And so I can be all over the place. And my case in point is we'll just go ahead and start this with Dan Sorensen. Sorensen is a player that I will defend to a certain extent. Um, I don't think he's the worst player in the world. I don't think it's a problem if he's on our 53-man roster. He clearly has made plays in key moments. And so that's kind of the optimistic side. The realistic side is, is the guy's like 31 years old. He's not athletic. He's at the point, for whatever reason, whether Spags is changing up things or whatever, he has made mistakes this year. He has had lapses in judgment and in my opinion we're better off if a player playing a position is young and they don't know the defense as well but they're much more athletic and they have a lot more upside at this point i'm much more in favor of that player getting to play whether that is one thornhill whether that is armani watts who is Gooch has pointed out during the preseason he got his two interceptions because merely he was in the right place at the right time where he was supposed to be. Gooch and I argued whether he should make the roster or not. Gooch wanted him to for that reason. For me, I didn't because I don't – he he's limited for me athletically, and I want to see athletes out there. But if my choice was between Sorensen and Watts, I'm probably going to take Watts because he still has upside, whereas Sorensen is on the wrong side of 30, the wrong side of, uh, of football age, 
and we already know what he is, and we're seeing him regress. Gooch, I'm going to let you respond as I deal with this stupid light. <sighs> Dan, Dirty Dan Sorensen. First, I want to preface this with the whole Watts comment that Keys is is talking about. We, I have been pushing that Watts narrative for a couple of years now. I'm I, I'm with Keys. Like if if I had to, if if it's between Dirty Dan and Watts, Watts. If it was between Watts and someone more athletic than Watts, then Watts is on the bench. However, I would like to point out. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to throw some of this at my fellow RGR mates that me and keys agreed on Watts. And now all of a sudden there's a couple of people, Dan Harms, Ryan Tracy, who now want to see Watts playing in the back aside from the Sorensen. I just want you to know y'all following the lead of the huddle. You know what I'm saying? We were here first, but, um, there is something that was brought. I, I, I agree. And I usually harp on Dan. I've wanted Dan off the team for the last two years. Um, and usually it, it's, it says something when I was watching Thunder Dan on YouTube. That's Thunder Dan 88. Check that out. And one of the commenters put in, and I can't think of his name. I want to give him due credit, but I can't think. It might have been Cole. It may not have been. But Dan is playing more snaps now than he's done any year previously. So not only is he on the wrong side of 30 for his position, he's now out there for more snaps, which is hindering the team a lot more. And I'm with, and Thunder Dan again, we love you too, buddy. But Juan can be in the wrong place because Juan has four four speed to make up ground. And I realize that the rule on the one digs touchdown was safety is supposed to be deeper than the deepest man. I get that, but Juan was going on instinct, which, of course, he may not have a lot of. I mean, he played at Virginia. They don't see a lot of NFL talent in his conference, which I think is what the ACC. Um, I mean, it's definitely not the SEC, right? Yeah. Um, And so he's biting on ball fakes and stuff, but you got to remember he he's really only played – what, 20 games because of the injury? I mean, so he's technically second year still. And I want everybody to remember that we had a cornerback who played the exact same way that Thornhill plays, and we never gave him crap for trying to play to his instincts. Marcus Peters won, got to a Pro Bowl that year, and we praised him until he became a headache. Now, all of a sudden, Juan plays the same way, and it's like, oh, we'd rather have Dirty Dan. We'd rather get beat by a tight end who runs a 4 9 40 as opposed to putting somebody out there that can actually cover him. I think Dan has his place. I think special teams would be great for him. Um, but I no longer want to see him roaming my defensive backfield, him or Neiman in my linebacker crew. Um, it's time to throw those young guns out there and see what they got. You spent all this money. I mean, even if you haven't spent a lot of money, because like Dorian O'Daniel is on a rookie contract, I believe still. Put that kid out there. Even if he can't get the linebacker role, he can run sideline to sideline. Can you imagine Gay and D.O.D.? with Bolton and that linebacker core. Now we're not complaining about the linebackers because the one thing we've got is speed to the edges. That would help in the run game. You can, you can play back far enough to where those linebackers can keep those slants in front of them. And in a sense, help your defense out because if they start out further back, all they're playing is downhill because you keep the slants in front of you. And if it's not a run, if it's not a pass, Hit the hole at full speed. You know what I'm saying? I just I'm um if we're gonna get into the state of this team, I'm gonna pass it back to Keys because when we get there, I'm just gonna tell you right now, this team sucks. And I'm not a non-believer, Dan. 
I'm not a bandwagon fan. I've been a fan of the Chiefs since Marty was the coach. Maybe even a year or two before. But as a whole, right now, this team is not hitting on all cylinders. It's not hitting on any cylinders, if you ask me. Because just like he said in the beginning of this rant, we could easily be 0-5. I mean, easily. And we could just as easily be 5-0. and Let's play the ball break. And if, you, if I'm going to get off this and I keep talking, but the Chiefs won a lot of close games the last two years that they shouldn't have. And if you go back over the history of the NFL, when you're seven and one in games decided by a touchdown or less, you generally come back closer to the middle yeah. the next year. So, I mean, as we're, as they're not playing well right now, they need to focus more because those games that we were winning, this is probably the year that we don't, unless we've got a two touchdown lead. All right, boss, it's on you, Keith. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going to – just to add, with Sorensen, I don't mind if he's out there with three safety looks. If Spags has a specific role for him that he can do well that helps the defense, I'm 100% for it. But playing the role that Juan was playing before he got injured isn't something that Dan can do. He just – he can't do it. And so – I'd rather have one out there breaking the rust off, even if he's relearning the whole defense, even if he's making mistakes over Dan, because there's no future on this team for Dan, like looking years ahead, next year, year after, whatever. There is no future. There's still possibility of a future for one. We're setting it two and three. Like you got to stop playing Dan simply because People think that he's always in the right place at the right time, which one isn't true. But even if it were true, it doesn't matter. Like, hey, guess what? You could give me the playbook and I'll study it for the next year. Are you going to put me out there because I know where to be? You're not going to do that. Why not? And so, I I mean, it's it's not an argument that I'm willing to buy for multiple reasons and it's not because i'm a dan Sorensen hater i've defended and people would know over the in the chat the last two years i have defended dan Sorensen when people hate on him but i'm yes, also not gonna i'm also not gonna be rosy and i want to say something about uh the whole bandwagon fan thing because it's before, really before annoying before you get to that before you get okay. to that i want to point out that i saw a stat today that quarterbacks are <laughs> The quarterback rating when throwing at Dan Sorensen is 153.3. That's right. That is – huh? That's the perfect quarterback rating, right? 156. 156 okay. is the perfect. But if, if they keep at that rate, he would be on pace to give up. This is just throwing at Sorensen or the guy that Sorensen is supposed to cover. I think it's 56 to 60 catches, 896 yards, and I think 17 TDs. That's just throwing at Dan Sorensen. So, okay, now you can go to the bet. For those That's that think insane. like, and and Keys is a big, he was, he supported Dan. I was the guy, look, you want a Dan Sorensen hater? That's me. I'm the Dan Sorensen hater, have been for three years. Keys is the one that's fine. I'm, I'm welcome. To, like, I opened the door. He came on in. It's about time is all I'm saying. <laughs> go ahead on your bandwagon fans, Keys. Go ahead. Go ahead. Get on them. That's it. I don't hate Dan. I just think he needs to be in the role that, that fits his where he's at right now in his stage of his career. And that's not start it, that's not starting over Thornhill. All right. I want to say something about the whole bandwagon fan label because the way that I've seen it be used is that if you say anything negative about this team, you're a bandwagon fan. Like you're only jumping on when things are great. Fan is short for fanatic, okay? And what people seem to be describing is what they're wanting is more likened to a romantic relationship where people are together at the beginning 
and they completely gloss over each other's faults because they're so romantically invested in each other and just blindly in love. Listen, I'm not blind, okay? Don't question my fanhood. Don't question Gucci's fanhood. Don't question anybody's fanhood because they have the audacity to tell the truth, to be realistic about things, and to not just gloss over everything, okay? We love our team. We, we, we're not blindly, romantically in love with our team to where we're going to let everything slide because the reality is, is this team has to play a lot better if it's even going to make it to the playoffs, and it's got to play even better than that if it's going to make it to the Super Bowl. And as we saw last year, and as I said in the chat all last year, when I was being very critical of this team, it's got to do a lot of things better or it's not going to win the Super Bowl. Andy on top himself of that, said today, let me just finish with this part and then we'll. No, go Andy ahead, himself go ahead. said today, he hates to lose. He is not about losing. Andy has no time for losing, not even a game. I am the same way. So when I'm being critical, I'm looking forward throughout the rest of the season of things that they have to address because there are things that if they don't address, they're not making the playoffs or they're not making the Super Bowl. And they're not winning the Super Bowl. And so if you're not playing to win the Super Bowl, what are you playing for? If you want to be a fan of a team that's not making the playoffs or not making it to the Super Bowl, pick a different team. Okay, Pick the Jacksonville Jaguars. Pick most of the rest of the AFC West before this year. (laughs) There's plenty of teams that you can choose from. You can be a Lions fan, a Bears fan. Otherwise, you can strike a balance between sticking with your team but also recognizing and pointing out faults and the things that it needs to correct. And we can do so, and we can stop calling people bandwagon fans because we actually are calling out the faults along with the strengths. Yeah, Uh, and we had a little video chat um, a couple nights ago and was asked the same question I was asked because um, I love Patrick Mahomes. I love the Kansas City Chiefs. I always have, always will. I think Mahomes is great. I just don't think he walks on water. And um, and as far as I know, there's only one guy. Um, and uh, I said he needs to get back to fundamentals. He needs to work on his footwork, which is all the same stuff that he said in his press conference today. So it's not the fact that I hate the Chiefs or I'm a Mahomes hater or I'm just trying to come down. Like, I I can legit look at it and tell for real, for real, he's not comfortable. He's used to playing backyard football all the time because, let's face it, guys, White House, Texas isn't NFL growing, you know what I'm saying, proving grounds. Texas Tech doesn't push out NFL players every year. So he's running for his life. Then the Super Bowl, where he actually did run for his life. And now he has to hear Patrick and every other pro athlete who is worth their salt in what they do are the best at that position. And he hears they gave you an upgraded offensive line. And so now he's trying to figure out how to become a pocket QB when that's not in his nature. Now, Andy can fix some of this by doing rolling pockets to get him more comfortable. But you know what? Our guys aren't built for that either. These guys are road graders and they form a pocket. But if you watch the game against, if you watch the game against the Bills, Mahomes looked nervous. He was scared to step up. Like, and you, I I understand 350 pound guys who run four six and hit like, you know, freight trains. I get it. But those big meat guys he's got in front of him are there to keep that from happening. He's got to, like, I don't know if it's because of the toe. I don't know if it's because of the knee, if that's in the back of his head. But he is still, he's got happy feet back there. He's not comfortable. Um, And until he gets comfortable, the O-line's not going to get comfortable, which means the offense is going to look out of sync, which is where you're going to get those balls thrown into the ground. We see it. 
I'm sure Ryan sees it because um, film is what he does and analytics. Patrick even sees it. But you guys are keeping these lofty expectations like, oh, it's the defense or his receivers aren't catching or whatever. It, it all goes hand in hand. I mean, but it starts with him. He's not comfortable. The offense doesn't flow. And it, um, I don't know if y'all saw during the game, I think it's the first time I ever saw Andy Reid yell at the offense during the game. So even he knows something's not right. Um, they'll get it together, I'm sure. But you can't call people bandwagon fans or question their loyalty because it's not automatically the ref's fault when we lose a game. Or it's not automatically Tyreek's fault that um, he dropped the ball, which could have been a first down or gave up the pick six or whatever. I mean, give them a break, guys. They'll turn it around. If they don't, we'll be picking in the middle of the draft this year. I mean, I'm still not going to root for him any less, but we just have to be easy. Like, we all care. Um, we care about the team and the success and everything. Um, I think Thunder Dan, and I'm going I'm to quit dragging this on, but and I keep bringing up Thunder Dan because he was the last thing I seen. I did bring up Dan Harms earlier, but one of the questions he asked is, is when did we get so spoiled? that the sky is falling all of a sudden because we're two and three. The problem is, I think, is we've been waiting on a QB like Mahomes since Lynn Dawson. He's won 40 out of his 50 games up until last night. And so now we're accustomed to winning. And when we don't, the sky is falling. The problem is, is that some of us can't be this accustomed to winning because 50 games there's about 200 that some of us sat through where we weren't winning at all. I mean, um, so we just need to settle down. We've had a Super Bowl. We've been to another one and lost. Um, the sky is not falling. Mahomes is only 24, 25. I mean, if he plays to 40, that's 15 more years. So just, just relax. It'll get worked out. Yeah. I think you know, I, I think there's a lot there, you know, with, with that comment. Um, you know, I think there's a part where those of us who were here before Mahomes got used to always having a great defense always having a great running back, you know, always having a great tight end. I mean, it was just, you know, even, even always having a great pass rusher. There was always somebody who was a great pass rusher, whether it was Derek Thomas or Jared Allen or Tom Bahali or then Justin Houston. Like, you know, there's been, there's been a lineage all the way down. And so we've gotten used to these certain things. And now that we finally have the quarterback that we've been waiting all these years for, yeah, we're a little spoiled. We want all of it together. And now that we're seeing the quarterback without the rest of it, it's kind of angering. It's kind of frustrating. You know, you have people who we had everything. We just needed the quarterback. Now we have the quarterback and defensively, it seems like we need basically everything. And so I can understand some of the frustration there, but I think there is a lot more patience and appreciation for those fans who are 50, 60, 70 years old, who really did have to wait, you know, a, a good chunk of time after Lenny until Patrick basically. And so, you know, I think that's one part of it. And so I can, I can understand that part. Maybe I'm that way a little bit. Um, but then I think there's people who have written checks that, that with their mouths that the Chiefs are not cashing now. Like there are people who literally just thought the Chiefs were unbeatable 
and now they're losing. And some of it is seeing kind of the lure of Mahomes, like, die in front of our eyes, right? He never lost to Lamar. He never lost to, Ju- you know, well, I mean, Justin Herbert's only been in the league for a year. But he didn't lose to Justin Herbert when, when he played him last year. You know, he never lost to, to Baker Mayfield. He never lost to, to, uh, to Josh Allen. And so all these guys that get compared to him and, and people, you know, it doesn't help when people – come out and say idiotic things like if we were starting a franchise right now, I take Justin Herbert over Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen's the best quarterback in the NFL. Right. And so I think that's part of it as well as people just, we need to be humbled along with the rest of the team, but some of it is just like anger and frustration that kind of the, the myth of Mahomes is kind of crumbling before us. We had this awesome myth, you know, he never lost a game by more than, than one possession. He never lost to any of these other great up and coming quarterbacks. You know, he never this, he never that. He never he never lost in September. He never threw a September interception. All of these things and they just crumbled right before our eyes this year. And we have to remember and we have to be patient because with the pandemic going on for the last year and a half, like in our personal lives, which seeps into our, our our sports fandom, we're seeking control in really weird ways right now because there's a lot of ways in our lives that we don't have control that we had before last February. And so, you know, I think we see some of that creep in here. So I think there's a lot, a lot to play there. Um, I do think that there's some truth to what Dan said, uh, but I also think that there is – some reason to genuinely be concerned about the state of this team because right now it just looks like everything is in shambles. And like you said, we've never seen Andy scream at players. So like we're even seeing it in the coaching staff. Like I don't want to say that they seem clueless, but it seems like there's a lot of frustration and, and you know, the more this happens week in and week out, the more pressure there is on the coaching staff. And so, I don't know, there's just a lot, there's a lot there to it. Now, I do want to say, though, that I do agree that a lot of the things that are, a lot of the things, not the people, right, not the players, a lot of the things on this team that are the issues are correctable. Some of them are fluky. Some of the interceptions have been fluky. Getting back to fundamentals is a correctable thing. Getting back, whether that's staying in the pocket, whether that's throwing mechanics, uh, which we've seen have just been terrible the last couple of weeks. Patrick has been, like, just throwing stuff in the ground. Where it got to the point where I'm like, Patrick's just throwing at people's feet now on purpose. But I don't think that was it. Um, And fundamentals of tackling and learning or relearning whatever the case is with, with a defensive secondary communication. And the only thing that makes sense, as someone else pointed out, maybe it was Dan Harms, like possibly they change stuff up because it doesn't make sense that you get rid of Bashad Breland and you only add like Hughes and uh, a full Baker. season of Baker and – what, Keys and Lamons, who I, I don't even know if Keys, Keys is on the practice squad. But you shouldn't go from having a decent job in the secondary communicating to just like a complete chaos. And especially when it's with guys like Sorensen. And I believe maybe it was uh, Thunder Dan had said he's seen maybe – it was Thunder Dan who said he thought they switched some things up. I think he was saying on our call the other night, it looked like even Matthew, even Tyron had been in the wrong place at the wrong time on plays this year, making it seem like maybe they switched some things up on, on the secondary. And I really hope that's the case because I don't see otherwise how there's, how there's an excuse. Like I'm not saying Bashad Breland wasn't an integral part of our defensive secondary. I, I fully believe he was but not to the point that losing him just throws Dan Sorensen, the Honey Badger, and everybody else into chaos as far as communication. And so 
some of the stuff is correctable. Things that aren't correctable is Dan Sorensen's play. What's correctable is how Spags uses him. What's correctable is, you know, we knew there was going to be some growing pains on the offensive line. Like, we knew that. And I fully believe that they'll continue to gel. They'll continue to get better. But right now, and, you know, that's that's an optimistic approach, right? We don't know for sure that that that's going to happen. But, I mean, we've already been impressed by – by Tooney and uh, Creed and Trey, it's been our tackles who, who've kind of been behind here. Niang got beat, you know, in multiple games. Orlando Brown's gotten beat. He's had a problem of get. both of them are, have been getting penalized. That's, those are issues we think they can get better at, but we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure that Orlando Brown will be here next year because right now it doesn't look like he can play left tackle in this offense, but we don't know that. There's the possibility he could. There's always the possibility that this team continues to get better every week. And so while there's a balance between the extremes of the sky is falling and we are not going to say anything bad about the state of this team, you know, because everything's going to be perfectly fine. Right, 2018. Oh, we lost four games or five games, whatever, whatever the stat that somebody was throwing out was. Well, it was a different team in 2018. It was also, was that Spags' first year, or was that yeah. Sutton's last year? I think it was hadn't Sutton's been Sutton's last year. Hadn't been Sutton's last year because Spags took over the first year and we went to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but the point is, if I can remember my point, the point is is that you know we're gonna see some growth. You know, it's very likely we see some growth, but it's not. We can't take it for granted either. Like we can't take it for granted that everything's gonna stay as bad as it is, but we can't also take it for granted that everything's gonna work out perfectly. In some sense, you know, we can point to the Buccaneers last year were nine and seven, squeaked into the playoffs, and won the Super Bowl. So at the end of the day, we don't have to be thirteen and four or fourteen and three or twelve and five, which we predicted the two of us predicted somewhere between what, twelve and five and fourteen and, and three. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I mean, what we predicted is still possible. We we saw them losing some games. I really thought the ones that we believe it or lost so far believe it or not, were winnable, though. The games, the games that we picked for them to lose are the games that they lost. So, I mean, it's, it's like these, they were the, these were the games. Well, for you, I, I think I made an argument against them losing the Ravens game. But <laughs> there was always that caveat. There was always that caveat in there, and that caveat came to fruition. The caveat was if Greg Roman can stick to their offense and run the ball and not get caught up into the, I got to make sure that everyone sees that Lamar is as good as a passing quarterback as Patrick. That was a winnable game. Guess what? Guess what? That was the mistake. That was the mistake that Kevin Stefanski made this year. That's the reason. That's the only reason we won that game. Kevin Stefanski made that same mistake. I said it. He tried to. He tried to prove Baker Mayfield was as good as Mahomes, and he got away from the run game. We've all seen. We've all seen mediocre teams now run on this defense the way it is. If they had stuck with the run game, we had no chance to stop them. So and, we and, lost some and, of the games we won last year was that exact same thing. And as you said, those close games, part of that was coaches having to be patient this year. Patrick has to be patient to take what they give him, but the opposing offensive coordinators have to be patient enough to try to not get into that contest of proving that their quarterback is as good as a passer as Patrick. And if they stick with the run game, they're having success. And and uh, for those of you that, that, 
have laid the blame of that Baltimore loss on on Clyde's feet. Um, Clyde doesn't get the opportunity to fumble that ball if Mahomes takes that sack on third and 11 instead of throwing that pick or third and whatever it was. We were up 11. If he takes the sack, we punt the ball away. They have to go the length of the field to score, and then we get the ball back to run out the clock. But we're winning. We're not trying to drive for a game-winning field goal. So, I mean, I realize, again, that Patrick can do no wrong, but he knows what he has to work on, on top of the fact that he has to quit staring down Tyreek and Kelsey. Everybody's going to play the Tampa Bay defense. They want you to be Alex Smith. Show them that you can be. That's that's the only way you're going to get that's the only way you're going to get the defense to open up to give you those better looks because they know, just like some of us know, that you want the 20-yard play. We know it. You've got the arm for it. You can make every throw at every angle. There's no doubt in your talent. But if they're leaving you in the middle of the field, fourth quarter being behind is not when you attack that. You attack that from the word go. Um, that is That is – I think the I think that thinks is one thing about Andy's coaching is he gives you the play, which I'm sure Andy knows, but then he gives you the ability to change it and then make the decision instead of forcing you like uh, I believe Keys brought up um, is it Dable that's their, their offensive coordinator in Buffalo? The Bills? Yeah. Yeah. They make Josh Allen throw on first and second down, but they throw routes at him where he only has to read one receiver, and it's pitch and catch. And that's how his completion percentage has stayed so high. That's how they've moved down the field. What? His completion percentage has went down this year. This year? I already said he was going to come back to the mean, but last year, that's how he was, that's how he was completing so many passes because it was – Short looks right out, just like a running play. Boom, hands, receiver. Um, and for those of you that are Bush League enough to either say that the fault of this team is because of what's happening with Andy's son or with Andy's health or the fact that Andy has no parts of the defense and so we need somebody who controls a whole team. First of all, it's Bush League to think that um, that man's full focus isn't on the job that he's paid to do. It's Bush League to use his health because Andy is old enough that if it was bad enough to affect his coach and he would step away, which is the whole reason after his, his previous family thing, he wasn't even going to come back to coaching. And that's why Clark Hunt got on a plane and flew to Philadelphia. They didn't wait for him to come here. They went to meet him because he was prepared to walk away then. And if you don't think that Andy doesn't touch defense, you do realize that being an offensive guru means he has to scheme his offense to play against defense. And so I'm sure that he gives Spags his offensive game plan and they sit in and they figure out how they're going to beat it. He's in those meetings, Ryan said himself, Andy runs that whole team. So I'm sure when Spags puts a defensive game plan up, he walks up to Andy and says, Hey, let's go over this. This is what they do. This is what I think about doing. Please believe that Andy is as smart as they come. The, the whole, the greatest coaches in history are not one-sided. They're everything. Belichick is considered a defensive coach. He has his hands in everything. Um, Everybody, all the good ones, um, Vermeil, Andy Reid, all the Hall of Fame coaches, Tomlin, who was a defensive coach. Tomlin hasn't had a losing season since he's joined Pittsburgh. These guys that control franchises, Jim Harbaugh, Marv Levy, um, all those guys, they have their hands in everything. So I, it's actually 
insulting to hear, oh, Andy's just an offensive guru. That's his favorite side of the ball. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have his hand in everything else. All right, I'm done ranting. Just don't don't mess with Andy Reid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I got about I got about three responses. One, I want to point out that I said months ago that Josh Allen's completion percentage was inflated because the Bills took advantage of analytics and had Josh Allen throwing on non traditional passing downs. So the defense was keyed up to play the run and that saved Josh Allen from getting rushed. We know good and well if you rush Josh Allen, if you blitz him, just like we same thing with Baker Mayfield, right? And we know the same thing with with uh, Justin Herbert. Is it Justin Her- Not Justin Herbert. Uh, I don't remember. Who did we just play? That's where I'm Josh at Allen. right now. Yeah, if you blitz these guys, like they fold. Josh Allen, that's what they were doing to protect him. That's why he had an artificially high, you know, much higher than even his college career completion percentage is because they had him completely insulated. That is what I was saying. I kept telling everybody's like, oh, it's the greatest jump in completion percentage in the history of football. And I'm like, he's going to come back. Guys, he wasn't this accurate in college. He wasn't this accurate. He played in the Mountain West. He wasn't that accurate in the Mountain West. And you think all of a sudden that Josh Allen is an 80% completion percentage star? That's that's Aaron Rodgers. That's Drew Brees. That's not, I mean, that, Mahomes hasn't sniffed 75. You think Josh Allen is going to throw better completions than Mahomes? Very in Mahomes, few Mahomes defense. In Mahomes' defense. Every defensive coordinator thinks every down is a passing down because it could be. So, I mean, he's that's true. And, and one of the, and one of the things one of the things that I think it might have actually been Pat in his in in the presser today or maybe Andy. I think it was one of the two of them said, "Hey, you know, look, we're playing, we're playing, we're seeing different defenses than any other team in the NFL. No other team is being played the way that we're being played." you know, by defenses right now. So you have to, you have to, while Gooch is rightfully saying things and Mahomes even admitted himself, he's got to go back to fundamentals with things. You know, this is where we can be realistic, but we can also be optimistic as well because Mahomes is facing defenses that nobody else in the NFL is seeing. And if you look at his numbers, they're very close with the exception of the interceptions. And again, How many of those, at least two or three or four, have been off of receivers' hands, both of their hands, not one of their hands, but both of their hands this season? With the exception of interceptions, most of the stats, the big stats, look the same as last year. Like this offense, I I think, um, I don't know if it's expected points added or what, but there is one metric where, this offense is actually better than last year's, which surprised me because of the amount of turnovers. And so, which was something Andy said needed to be corrected. He was asked about the defense and Andy said, you know, the offense needs to take care. Like, you know, basically we can't just blame the defense. The offense has to take care of the ball. We can't have turnovers on the offense. And he said, Andy said, if we eliminate the turnovers, we can win which I think is a positive thing, but I think it's also kind of, it kind of makes me cringe at the same time because he might be right in that, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be corrected. And my hope is when he said that, he doesn't mean if we can eliminate turnovers, we're going to kind of, we're going to ignore some of the bad things that we haven't corrected, that they didn't bother to correct last year, that they didn't bother to correct the year before. Uh, you know, maybe that means that, that they can get away with keeping Sorensen out there all three downs. And if that's what he means, if any of that's what he means, then I don't like it at all. But I'm willing to go on the optimistic si- side and say, yeah, you know, a win is a win. But once you get to the playoffs, those wins come a lot harder to come by. I, I um, think, I think, I don't presume to speak for Coach Reed. Um, I wouldn't. 
But the one thing that I do know is that Andy Reid coach teams turn the turn the football over few and far between. And I think when he says that if we eliminate the turnovers, I think more so what he means is is rule number one from Pee Wee: protect the football. They teach you how to to cradle it, how to tuck it, how to do all that. And I think it's if we eliminate the turnovers, we can focus on you know, the other things, like the turnovers are, are like number one. Eliminate the turnovers, then we can start talking about routes and, and eliminating the little things because um, it, it sounds like coach speak, but really he's right. Like Andy Reid coach teams don't turn the football over. Not like this. Um, not, the, not at the rate that they've been doing it. Um, somebody brought to my attention, I was a big, just this past week, was a big defender of Pringle because he actually suffered a perfect hit on that fumble. But then somebody brought to my attention that he's put the ball on the ground three out of the last five games. That's not protection. I can excuse the one because the guy actually did get his head around, even though it was tucked in the opposite arm and put his crown on the ball. But that's, if you take out that game, half the games you played in, you put the ball on the turf. That's not ball security. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's it's that kind of stuff. Like, it's a shame that as pro athletes, we're sitting here ranting about Dan Sorensen not wrapping up to tackle. And we're, we're talking about not protecting the football from these guys who have played football and get paid millions of dollars to do so. We're, we're trying, we're going back to the bare bare knuckles, bare basement, Mm -hmm. you know, protect the football. Um, And that's what I think he means, like, okay, if we eliminate the turnovers, we win some games, sure, because that's the old adage, you win the turnover battle, you win the game. But also he knows, just like we know, if we we can see it, and you and I uh, don't watch film like Ryan, uh, but if we can see it just in our own eyes, and I played football, if you can see, if we can see, sure, darn sure, darn sure, Andy can see it. You know what I'm saying? Because he he's, um, I don't know if, if anybody knows, they did a whole Kansas City Star did a whole piece on him, um, where they followed him around for a week, and that guy is in the office from 3 a.m. to midnight. Then he goes home, and he sleeps until 2 2 30. Gets up, takes a shower, and he's back in the office. At 3 a.m., all he does is watch film and draw plays and and try to figure out how to get better. So believe when Andy says he doesn't like to lose and it all starts with him and they just need to clean stuff up, he knows what it is, and he's true with that. It all starts with him, which is why he puts in more hours than anybody else um, at 60-something years old. Where was I going with this? I was going with this just to say to relax. Um, the sky's not falling. It's only two and three. It's a 17 game season. It's the AFC West. The Raiders are going to Raider. We know that's going to happen. The Broncos are playing way above their ceiling right now. And Herbert, right now, Herbert's getting lucky. And there's a couple games he should have lost already this year. The AFC West should be a lot closer. We've just been getting bad bounces. And we're only five games in. There's 12 to go. 12 to go. And seven spots in the AFC for playoffs. So right now, the Chiefs are still in the top seven. So, I think. Or inside the top ten, anyway. Um, so we'll be all right. I mean, the people that, aside from the Ravens and the Bills, we have the tiebreaker over the Browns. So if the Browns are on the verge of getting in and we're tied with the Browns, guess what? We've got the spot. And I have I have no doubt that, like, take this game coming up. I think – I don't normally like doing predictions like this. Obviously, if you watch the Pigs pool, I've had a rough couple weeks while Keys has been super successful. Um. I think the, I think a dog walk happens this Sunday on Washington, and and I think it just they're gonna call it a get right game, 
I'm going to call it an angry as heck game. Um, because I think, um, I don't, Thunder Dan says, if you've been in a defensive huddle, you know those guys are mad when they give up five yards. That may be true. But you know what the ultimate motivator is for a pro athlete is being embarrassed on national TV. And 38-20, they were embarrassed. Not only were they embarrassed, but the commentators were also dumping on them. So not only was the game bad for those watching in the stadiums at home, We also had to listen to Chris Collinsworth talk about how bad Mahomes was and how bad the Chiefs were playing. And, I mean, they were dumping. And so I really see this game as being, um, I don't want to say statement game, but a reminder game that once we figure out who we are, you should be very scared. You know, I'm I'm going to counter that point. I'm going to counter that point for just a second because we played this game before we played this in a game called Super Bowl 55. And then the defense came out the way that it did from week one this year. You have what five, six months to work your butt off and to take your reputation back after getting embarrassed in the largest stage the Super Bowl, and they didn't do it then. So, and you know, I think that's part of, I think that's part of fan frustration right now. It is, you know, as I said, in other places, we have not seen a good game by the coaching staff, by the defense, by the offense since the AFC championship game against the Bills last year. We have not seen a good game by anybody as a whole. I mean, Patrick's had great performances. Tyreek and and Travis have had great performances. But I'm talking about the offense as a whole unit, the defense as a unit, and the coaching staff as a unit. Like, we haven't seen a good game from them, from people. We haven't seen great game plans. We've seen – we're five games into this, this season, and we've heard the same thing that we heard after the Super Bowl. We didn't expect them to come out and do this. We were expecting them to come out and do that. We've heard that four times since the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl and the three losses we had this year. We might even heard it in some of the one of the two wins. We weren't expecting this. We weren't expecting this. We weren't expecting them to come out and play zone. We were expecting more man. Even this last week, it's like, how are you still expecting it this far into the season when every team has now shown you this is what they're going to do, and you've seen that it's stopping your offense. So there's a sense there that's kind of maddening. As far as people dogging on Andy, I think that there's a place where they're not actually dogging on him that they should. And I think that's when they're dogging on Brett Veach. Because I don't believe that Brett Veach is actually the one in charge of player acquisitions. Like, I don't think he's the one selecting the players on this roster. I think that's Andy. And so people are giving Beach a hard time for the players that are on this roster. But whether it's Beach or not, Andy, you can't tell me Andy doesn't have the final say of who's making the roster or not. And so if people, in my mind, and Gooch, you can, you can tell me if you think I'm wrong on this. If you think that Beach is picking all the players and Andy and Spags and enemy are just trying to have to make the, the pieces of the puzzle fit and make a pretty picture out of what Veach is handing them. But in my mind, Andy has, Andy has final say. It's more like Veach is coming to him and showing him pictures of players and, and, and Andy's pointing, I want that one, or I want that one. Okay, let's get rid of this one. That's Andy. It's not Reed in my, or it's not Veach in my mind. So if people are having a problem with Veach for player personnel, I think they're actually having a problem with Andy, and that's one of my other main problems, <laughs> is that at any point this season, Andy could get fed up enough to say, Steve, Thornhill's starting. All right, anyway, I'm going to give you a response on that. I think it's Veach. Uh, the only reason why I think it's Veach, 
and not Andy is because he had that control in Philadelphia and it burnt him out. I mean, it, it really ran him out because he spent all that time and money trying to be the GM and the coach, and that's when he got his famed dream team that became a dumpster fire, and I think he even set himself to trying to wear both hats, was hard on his family, hard on his health, hard on everything. But I think I think Ryan said it best. Um, I think a lot of it, I think Veach falls in love with guys, and he doesn't see the flaws, and so he goes to Andy and he says, hey, I love this guy. I'm going to get you him and Andy because all of this has to go through Clark anyway. Like, that was Clark's biggest thing. Andy talks to Veach. Veach and Andy talk to Clark. Um, And I think it – I think Andy, which in a sense – and I'm going to side with you kind of. His arrogance, which makes him and Belichick great coaches, is also his downside. Because he knows, like he knows the guy has talent. He may not fit, but Andy in his head, I can make it work. Or my guys can make it work. My my staff, you know what I'm saying? So go ahead and get him. And, and I think that's where it's getting him. But I think this is, I think this is all Veach. And mark it down right now. This upcoming draft, wherever we finish, even if we win the Super Bowl, there are going to be a lot of people gone, and we're going to see a lot of fresh new defensive faces because you know Veach is hearing this, um, and he's seeing what's on the field too, and he's like, damn, that was my guy, that was my guy, that was my guy. Um, I, I think some changes are going to be happening. You don't, you don't pay Patrick half a billion dollars to not win. Um, And who knows? Yeah, I, I think we're, I think we're close here. Like, I don't think Andy is doing everything. I don't think he's calling other teams for trades. I don't think he's looking at the free agent list. I don't think he's doing all, all the stuff he was doing in Philadelphia, but I think he's telling Veach, this is what I want. You know, this is the qualities I'm looking for, or these are the things that we want to emphasize on the offensive side or defensive side and Veach and his staff are doing the work. And then they're coming and saying, all right, here's three or four guys. And then he makes, makes the case for each guy. And Andy, Andy saying, all right, this is the guy. Or Beach says, I think this is a guy. What do you think, you know, out of these three or four? And Andy's saying, yeah, this is the guy. Or no, this is the guy. And uh, I don't know. We could be wrong. Uh, one thing I wanted to go back and point out before, before my battery dies here is you're talking about the coaches. And I think some of the, the whole coach thing and the whole Andy and defense thing comes back to – one of the comments, I don't know if it was Romo or Collinsworth or someone, was talking about uh, the Chargers. Oh, you know, the, oh, was, was it Collinsworth? I think it was – I don't remember who it was. Uh, I should because I remember calling them an idiot afterwards. But they basically said that the Chargers are the team to beat for, like, way into the future because they have the perfect combination, which is great quarterback – and great defensive head coach. Like, that's the winning formula, right? Because that's that's what the Patriots had, right? Great defensive head coach and great quarterback. That's the combination. So I think that's where some of the, def- the defense thing comes in. But as you were saying, and, and I want to point this out, Brandon Staley was a college quarterback. He played offense before he got into defensive coaching. Bill Belichick, I believe, was a off – I think he was a tight end in college. He started out on the offensive side of the ball. So, I mean, again, you know, like the basics are there. You know, it, if you have to know defense to know offense, just like Spags has to know some offense to coach defense. So, I don't know. Any last things you want to say here about the state of this team as it stands this week? This guy is not falling, guys. It's been a rough start. It's two and three. 
to be a great champion, you have to be humbled. Um, every single one of them has been humbled. Uh, all champions of the past. Before Jordan could beat Magic in the Lakers, he was humbled by the Pistons. Before Gretzky became the great one, he was humbled by the Canadians, if you like hockey. I mean, it just it just happens. You know what I'm saying? Um, Boston Red Sox were always humbled by the Yankees. It, 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 you have to go through this. Um, it, it's uh, everybody has to go through trials and tribulations to see victory on the other side. Um, and that's all this is. It's a bump in the road. We have to have it um, without bumps and trials and you know no no battle scars um you know you can't really embrace or or even relish in victory you know what i'm saying i mean if it's if it was given to you you couldn't enjoy it you wouldn't respect it um so just take a chill pill um trust in the process and uh um uh, yeah We'll be here at the end. I have I have full belief in that. You, Keith? Yeah, I'll just say the sky might be falling, but probably not. Uh, that's that's the realistic optimist, right? Uh, probably not. It could be, but probably not. But I I I think you're right. Like, if it wasn't for the turnovers, and Andy can say the turnovers, but if it wasn't for the turnovers. We could be five and zero, oh, and that would be worse than being two and three. In that, there are fundamental issues that they have to get back to and they have to fix. That they could have been winning through, and they probably wouldn't have fixed because they were winning, and they would have just said, "Well, we're still winning, so who cares?" But because they're losing, they're being forced to go back and fix things, things that have been an issue for at least a year or more. And so, I think that's a positive. On the negative side, and this was a point I was going to make earlier, you know, I'm not 100% sure that even the Alex Smith offense is what is needed. I think that in some way that could exacerbate the problem because when you're forced to, when you, when you have the big play taken away from you and you're forced to matriculate the ball down the field, that presents that means that you're running more plays that means that you have more opportunities for turnovers to take place you have more opportunities to commit penalties that kill your drive and i think that's part of what we're seeing this year because teams are taking the big play away from the passing game is you're seeing more drives killed by turnovers and penalties than even last year and last year we did see it you know, the games that Mahomes had lost previously in his career, the Chiefs had been the more penalized team with the exception of the AFC Championship, the D Ford game. And so I think part of that is what we're seeing is teams are saying, hey, go ahead and run 15 or 20 plays. We believe you're going to make a mistake. You're going to commit a penalty. You're going to, for- you know, you're going to commit a turnover. And I think that has something to do with it. And if that's the case, You know, maybe that is a little bit more concerning, but at the end of the day, I think it still comes back to playing disciplined football. And I don't think this team has played disciplined football in the last two years, maybe even longer. They've just gotten away with a lot of stuff because of Pat's abilities and the way they could hit the hit the deep play and and have a, a quick scoring offense. And the defense was good enough. So. I'm kind of in between. I do believe that they can get things corrected. I do believe our coaching staff is smart and talented. But at the same time, they've kind of let me down. So I'm hesitant to believe that they'll make the changes they need to change. Because everything in week 12 last year told them they should have taken a different approach between the first half of that game and the second half of that game and the way they planned out the Super Bowl. But they didn't. And again, they're, they still haven't accepted that they're not going to see man coverage as much 
as they are expecting to, and they haven't made that adjustment. They haven't adjusted to Dan Sorensen not shouldn't be the, the second safety on the field. They haven't okay. adjusted to Chris Jones shouldn't be full time at defensive end. It should be it should be team by team and situation by situation, and maybe he should be eased into it more against right. really good rushing teams. So there's a lot of things out there that though our coaching staff is great, there's enough out there that they've made mistakes that I'm not willing to say I completely 100% trust you. So I'm still hesitant on some of it because I said it leading up to the Super Bowl. If they do this, if they do this, you know, we should expect them to do this. They should do this. We're going to, you know, we can still win this game even with all the offensive linemen out. They didn't even try any of those things, which like everyone knew the offensive line was the weakness. Yet we were still trying to go deep. I don't need to rehash all of this. And so I say maybe, because I think that's the realistic approach. Do I expect it? I expect the coaching staff to do better, and I expect the players to continue to improve. But I'm also hesitant because they haven't shown me the last half a year or more that they've made the adjustments that they need to make. The coaching staff, whether it's arrogance, pride, stubbornness, whatever it is, I think they've left a lot to be desired. And so they haven't, they have to earn my trust back. I'm not just going to give it to them because I've been let down multiple times now since the Super Bowl, including the Super Bowl. Well said, my friend. Well said. All right. Well, if you got nothing left to say, you want to uh, send us on our way? Absolutely. We appreciate all y'all who watch this content, whether religiously or in passing. We are glad to be back. Um, you will be seeing more of us um, or per your usual schedule. Um, make sure you check out the RGR store. Subscribe to the channel. Go back, check out Ryan's other videos. If you're not a member, become a member. Join the Discord. You get to talk to me, Keys, Ryan, Dan, Thunder Dan, Jeff, Aaron, our, our mod father. Um, but normally this is where I would end it, but I want to I wanna, I wanna say a couple things. Um, one, um, even though it seems like at times uh, that Keys and I don't agree, which we don't um, sometimes, or that we don't agree with Ryan or Jeff or Dan um, or Thunder, there's still a respect um, there, and uh, we never intend to come off as disrespectful, and so we don't expect that out of anybody that is fans or members or followers of this channel. Be kind to each other in the comments. Um, we are kind to each other here at RGR. Our opinions are supposed to be different, um, and that's what makes for good content. That is why Ryan has us all doing this for opinions different than his own and you guys are getting different opinions from our own um and in this world of uh, this pandemic and all the rates and stuff like that you, being kind to people it, it's not just it's not just the right thing to do it's the human thing to do so make sure you tell somebody you love them and and we'll see you next time peace out guys thanks for watching Thanks for watching this video from the team at RGR Football. Click these videos to see more and subscribe to RGR Football.